<clears throat> Hello, friends. I'm going to start by doing a little bit of got more of a, a skin over it than, than normal. Must have been a while since I used it. These are oil sticks, not to be confused with oil pastels. And uh, as you can probably tell, This is part of my crazy abstract underpainting technique. All right, I think that's good enough. So this is, boy, I'm cooking these yesterday, last two days, aren't I? Daily Art Adventure number 876, which is first oil glaze and who knows? Question mark. Now the reason the reason I don't know is because, quite literally, I don't know. Uh, after the oil glaze, I have three options in front of me, <clears throat> and every painting is different. So I never know which option I'm going to go with until I'm staring at the painting with its new layer of oil glaze on it. So I'm picking up a little bit of, a bunch of liquid, by the way. So again, for those newcomers, here's what I'm talking about, liquid, the original. And because of that, it's, a, it's an odiferous product. I have a, an open window here, and I have a ceiling fan on, and the opposite door to my studio is a jar. I'm going to open this window a little bit. There's, it's quite a chilly day outside, so that necessitated putting on a sweater. <clears throat> all right, so let's just get started here. First of all, this very warm yellow-orange, very warm yellow-orange uh, glaze. And then go to my my go-to color. The one color I do, no doubt, more than any other for the initial oil glaze is uh, oxide red, which is brown, very close to reddish brown, very close to uh, burnt sienna, orangish, reddish brown. And I don't, I, I'd be hard pressed to tell you why it's my default go-to color the answer is because i like it <laughs> it's not a very good answer it looks good on almost every anything <clears throat> hello karen hello barbara Thank you both for joining me. I'm assuming you're both working. <laughs> Have me on in the background, which is the appropriate appropriate place while you're painting. I guess I'm going to go ahead and um, do uh, oxide red up here over the blue sky, too, because I have a pretty strong hunch I'm going to be going over that. <clears throat> hmm. Got myself in an unforeseen pickle. I don't have enough large brushes up here. I don't want to waste your time by running downstairs and getting some more. So I'm just going to give these a quick rub off. And I'll work my way toward the blue that I'm eventually going to put up there. But I have some intermediate colors I want to do, so I can do those right now. 
Um, so dirty brushes, as you can see, and I think I'm going to pick up some phthalo blue. And now some ultramarine blue, especially on this asphalt um, path trail here. And then just again pushing the the shadow in the corner down there with phthalo blue combined with what else is already there, the ultramarine and so forth, makes a nice neutral dark. Now, do I want any more dark up here? That might be good enough for now. Um, unlike in the my olden days, <laughs> before a year or two ago, um, when th this would be typically the, the only oil glaze that I would do, now I've changed quite a bit and I do uh, a later oil glaze, an oil, another oil glaze, glaze later in the process. So it'll still give me the opportunity to, to tweak broad areas of color and tone. I'm looking for a fairly supple cotton rag. Here we go. So I'm going to lift out very gently. Yeah, that might be blue enough right there. I do not need to do any more blue up there. It came out quite nice. <coughs> English majors that came out quite nicely being an adverb of came came nicely <laughs> my inner my inner English major is always haunting me won't leave me alone shut up <laughs> get the hints All right, that that might be that might be good enough. All right, so um, at the end of the glazing process, let me see if this helps you guys any. Oh yeah, that that does help you. Doesn't help me. I'll turn around in a minute. But I have three options. Years ago, after the oil glaze, I would always draw with small brushes, dark transparent color. And then three or four years ago, I started doing the pencil thing. So then it was either draw with either pencils or brushes, paint or pencil. And then again, a year or two after that, I started doing the glow, the fuzz layer. So now, um, see if I do drawing or pencil now and then do fuzz, the fuzz will eliminate a lot of the drawing. So in recent months, I've sometimes opted for going to um, fuzz. Anyway, so th those are the three options and every painting is different. So give me just a second here. Got some new chats. Chilaquil, Solano, welcome. Thank you for speaking up. Good to have you on board. Yeah, thanks for commenting on the, the sky holes, um, Barbara. <laughs> So this is layer, for those of you who are keeping score. <laughs> uh, I think it's 11. It's either 11 or 12. <clears throat> okay, let me just think for a minute. Fuzz or glow, fuzz layer. 
pencil or paint? I believe it's fuzz layer. How about that? I sort of I sort of didn't expect that. There is no right or wrong. It's very and that's why on the title of this broadcast I couldn't I couldn't tell um, you ahead of time uh, what I was going to do after the glaze because I simply didn't know. All right, so I am mixing up here on my palette. You see me looking down. <laughs> I don't mean discouraged. I mean I'm looking downward. <laughs> um, I'm mixing up an opaque. Well, it, it's yeah. I, but that is to say, I've picked up titanium white, and I'm mixing up a warm, very warm yellow or very yellowish orange, whichever, whichever way you like to put it. Very warm yellow is what I would call it. Okay. But I'm going to apply it in a very thin manner. And so what this is doing right now is I'm I'm not I'm not really impacting the, the lightest areas in here really much at all. In fact I'm making them darker and that will be that that will be reversed here in a little while. I'll make them lighter again later in the in the uh, final edit stage in the final edit layer I'll make them light again but what I am doing is lightening making the and I, I, I want it more orange here I am making the the branches and the trunks the trees that go in front of this sky distant distant sunrise um, lighter okay yeah so now there's even just even more of a glow there than there was just a few minutes ago. I want some of that same effect down here. It's the reflection of a lake down there. And I'm going to add a bunch of orange, a little bit of Scarlet Lake. <clears throat> so now I have a um, reddish orange color on my brushes. Oh, I don't want it lighter than that. And I I want to pick up some of this distant pine straw. In our part of the world, which I'll call, this is a Virginia scene about two hours from here. Um, pine trees cast off their needles. And when I was a kid growing up north, we just called them pine needles. <laughs> But when I moved to uh, North Carolina 30 years ago, I figured out that this part of the country, they have a, they call it pine straw. In fact, nurseries uh, will uh, actually bale pine straw and sell it to, to their customers, which was a completely new concept to me when I first moved here. Anyway, the, the floor, again, here's, you, you can see the photograph here the floor of the forest is completely carpeted with this beautiful orange brown <clears throat> pine straw and so i want to give that <clears throat> uh, a little bit of a glow not quite orange enough Let's see. and then I'm painting completely intuitively right now. I just like the color I've got on my brushes so much that <laughs> I'm just deciding, you know, I'd like some of that up here in the, up in the sky or up in these trees. Whether it makes any sense or not, right? Because we don't paint, so to speak, most of the time we don't paint by what makes sense. We paint by vision, by, <clears throat> by what looks good. It could be a hard transition to make for some, some people in their journey. Stop painting by analysis and paint by vision, by eyeball. I, I say often, we paint by eye, just like, like a musician playing by ear. Um, 
the great majority of the time as, as painters, as artists, we paint by eye, not by formula. Okay, I'm going to wipe off these brushes. Turn my light back on. It's giving you guys some glare, but can't be helped. <coughs> I think the, the last bit of glow that I need to do is uh, this asphalt path. I ne it needs to be a little bit lighter and bluer, cooler. Okay, I did, I, I did not define <clears throat> here today what, what is the fuzz layer. I usually do define that <clears throat> in case there's anybody new watching. Sometimes the fuzz layer comes later in the process, but it, it popped up early this time, right after the glaze. All right, the fuzz layer is translucent. It's very important. Nothing, nothing is opaque. Whoops. It's all translucent, that is opaque paint applied very thinly, right? Um, translucent paint, very soft edges, no, no definition at all. It's an anti-definition, <laughs> anti-definition league. <laughs> anti-definition stage of the painting process. Very soft edges. I s started this, stumbled on this technique um, uh, two and a half years ago, I think it was. I'm losing track now. Could be three and a half. It was, I was painting in downtown Raleigh, as I do so often. I was painting at a festival on the 4th of July. <clears throat> I remember it very well. And I had a, I was painting hundreds of people in front, you know, in the painting. And uh, it suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute, I should take some thin, um, translucent colors and just fuzz in various shades of color for their clothing. So that's exactly when it started. That's I did did my first fuzz layer. It was just one of those serendipitous discoveries like, wow, that worked pretty well. And so I very quickly started incorporating it into my painting process. I didn't know for a long time whether it was a you know, a, a, just a flash in the pan, a technique that was going to come and go, that I would just do it for a while and then leave it, or if it was, but it's, it's pretty safe to say now, it's, it's a permanent part of my voice, permanent tool in my toolbox, the fuzz layer. So I, I didn't finish defining it, soft edges, translucent color, not transparent, not opaque, right, right in between, and local color. And that, that third is, is a pretty significant, <clears throat> like you see, I just blewed up. <laughs> I just made these two tree trunks considerably cooler. And it works much better. That was very quickly done with um, the, again, what I call the fuzz layer. And there's these big boulders down here, strategically placed among the pine straw and uh, made those look, appear more, more cool, more cooler, I almost said. Even I would agree with my inner English major. <laughs> I would even, I would cringe with him if I had said more cooler. <laughs> um, okay, a few things. I want to do some green glow on the, some bushes. And, and and some blue up there in the sky. So we'll go with the green first. Uh, 
I uh, routinely keep my paints and point them. Can you see them? Well, not quite. Um, glass palette uh, with a cardboard-ish gator board, actually. Painted gator board on the back. It's more intense brown than I would like it, but that's, I was in a hurry. And then aluminum channel, U-channel around. So that's my palette. And uh, I have a couple of those here and there. And um, okay, so this is now green fuzz, green glow. Um, and I re routinely uh, keep my paints in the freezer. And it keeps them quite well. If you if you know you're not going to be painting for quite a while, um, then wrap up your palette in a couple layers of Saran wrap, and then put it in the freezer. I've had I've had paints stay good for over two years in that state. Saran wrap, two, three, four layers. I don't remember. Several layers of Saran wrap, uh, and in the freezer came back at least two years later and they were still usable. It seems to me like one or two of the one or two of the colors weren't in such good shape that everything else was perfectly fine. Alright, I think the fuzz layer, among other things, it, it really accomplishes um, the the local color aspect of it, the local color feature. That is local color that's Crazy artists talk for realistic color. Roses are red, violets are blue kind of color. Um, uh, the, the fuzz layer is a really fast way for color correcting your painting. Because you're painting not in little details, but big, broad, f quick areas. And uh, so it's a really good, really handy uh, tool for, for correcting the colors in your painting. Now I've got a pale phthalo blue on my brushes right now. I wasn't completely sure it was the color I wanted, but it seems to be working all right. I'm gonna darken it now just a little bit. Um, the painting is getting kind of pretty. Now it, it's lost, uh, not all, but it's lost a lot of definition, of course, right? It's all, right now, it's entirely too fuzzy, but not to worry, right? In fact, a, a painting that is too fuzzy is a lot easier to fix than a painting that is too tight. In other words, coming in and adding, adding hard edges is, for most of us, that's our, that is our native tongue. That is our, that is our default setting, is getting tight, right? So adding tightness to a painting is rarely a, a challenging proposition. It is challenging. What is challenging is adding uh, looseness or soft edges to a painting. So again, so that's another description of this fuzz layer. It's soft layer, soft edges on steroids. So right now, my painting is too soft, and that's a really happy place for me to be because I, my default setting, like most of yours, is Mr. Tidy. <laughs> so so tightening up is not a problem. That's where that's where this painting is going to go, whether I want it to or not. Most of the steps after this are going to be adding edges. <clears throat> I'm thinking now. Can you see me thinking? I'll make it obvious. I'll put my chin my, my hand on my chin. 
the universal thinking pose. I'm gonna lift out just a little bit here and there. All right, I'm ready for the next step. So <clears throat> now, the next step on this painting is either drawing with brushes or drawing with pencils. So get these, these pencils, they are a wax base, not as greasy as a, not as greasy as a, a grease pencil, but more greasy than say a Conti crayon. Um, so it's either draw with pencils or draw with pretty small brushes. Let me try to pick up. And at this point, I'm, yeah, I'm into my, you know, nice silver Grand Prix brushes. So pretty skinny lines at that point. And at the end of that stage, by the way, my painting will be too liney. Like right now, it's too fuzzy. Next layer, it's too liney. Again, not worried about either one. Because uh, in both cases, that was that issue will be counterbalanced by subsequent stages of the painting process. Um, but the colors in this, I don't know how they look to you. They don't look that great on my monitor. But the color, there, that looks better. The colors are quite rich, warm. I think the, only, the main thing that the, the painting's missing is, uh, subject-wise, is those firm, um, vertical, see hundreds of them in here, all those little trees, that, that'll, that'll be added, and that's, an, that's an easy, they're, they're in there now, but they're too subtle, right? Um, okay, I do want to make a decision though, do I, do I want um, pencil? Nope, I mean, yes. <laughs> Here's one of the ways I make that decision, pencil or brushes, and the, 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 the deciding factor is because I've already done pencil at least once, maybe twice in the acrylic stage. And the question is, do, can I still see a lot of pencil? And the answer is no, very, very, very little. I see a little bit, but very little. So good, pencil it is, but I'm not going to do that in this broadcast. I'll save that for later. Let's switch now to the other painting. So I'm gonna do the same process. Well, what I mean is <laughs> the same process of deciding what to do after the glaze. So the, the glaze, that, that, here we go again, that goes without saying, that is, I'm, I, the glaze is what I'm going to do next, right? And, uh, and then I don't know what I'm going to do after that, because that decision can only be made after I'm looking at the painting with the glaze on it. Am I making sense? I hope so. All right, first I do a business, yes, I get my, I think I'm going to, bring my my tall chair over here but first one item of business i guess i'll let you watch <laughs> is um <laughs> clean up my palette so there's there's my pile of liquid i like liquid gel because you don't need a, a clip-on cup you don't need a cup because it, it doesn't flow too much by the way it helps often most of the time if you remember to give your liquid a shake before you before we pour it up, because it does tend to separate a little bit. In fact, my good buddy David Foster, the other night at Painters Group, Painters Forum, he said he stores his liquid upside down. So well, that was a new one to me. And this over here is Alkid White. I just wanted, to, yeah, I guess it's still okay. These, a couple of those pile, big piles of green and big piles of dark red, those are unusual colors for me. Those are left over from my uh, painting escapade at Whirligig Festival um, the first weekend of November. So those, those have been on my palette for over six weeks. Um, and they're still usable. They might have they skin over a little bit. You know, generally speaking, you don't, you don't want to use paints that have skinned over, right, generally. Except, um, oh, I'll go ahead and show you while I'm at it. Am I still pointed? No, I'm not, hang on. Except that most of the time, I don't know if this is a, everybody does this, I have no idea. Most of the time when I'm picking up paint off my palette, 
I, I'm, I'm not coming down on the top of my pile of paint. I'm sliding my brush like this underneath. I'm getting paint from the bottom of the pile. And um, even though this pile of green is uh, about six weeks old, it might be a little skinned on top. I don't know. I'm not even going to test it. It's perfectly fine underneath. So there you go. I don't know if that's a... Maybe everybody does that, and I, I, but I've never mentioned it. it, and it's just a habit of mine. So I, I get my paint generally from the bottom of the pile, usually, not the top. Okay, now, so I'm going to glaze this again with liquid. And, and uh, one of the biggest questions in my mind right now is... What colors? Hang on, I'm still prepping my brushes here. I'm using Gamsol, of course, as a solvent for cleaning brushes. I say of course because, as I understand it, not, not without getting, like some people use Murphy's oil soap and vegetable oil and all kinds of things to clean their brushes to avoid using solvent. None of which work really very well, of course. <laughs> if it did, we'd all be using, you know, vegetable oil. But it, it does work to a, to a degree. But of, of the solvents proper, um, I think that uh, Gamzol is generally regarded. Feel free if anybody knows better than I did. I used terpenoid for many years. Uh, terpenoid natural, by the way. Here's, I don't know if you've discovered this or not. But uh, there are a number of natural products out there that are, no, I'm too, too low now. Hang on. There are a number of natural products out there that, and they, they, they say they're non-toxic. Um, just, just for those of you who might be new to the business, there are a number of natural products that sure enough might be non-toxic, but oh my goodness, do they smell to high heaven. Like some people love the lavender, um, I forget what, there's another word, lavender something, a, a bit of clove in it, I don't know, and, and it's non-toxic, but oh my goodness, I've used that stuff, some, I'm not going to say any brand names, but I've used it outdoors, painting, out on plein air, and nearly gassed myself out of the county using natural. Um, likewise, there's a, there's a terpenoid natural non-toxic natural yeah well it might be natural but number one it smells to high heaven and number two it actually eats devours eats up the rubber lining let me show you like this is you know in a good paint container there's a there's a rubber liner and uh oh i'm sorry i'm off picture sorry here it is and um there's a rubber liner right there right and and uh, terpenoid natural will flat eat that to nothing. It's natural. <laughs> so anyway, I guess the point I'm trying to make is not everything that is called natural is, is, is easy to work with. Um, there's some, I mean, terpeno, turpentine is natural, right? Perfectly natural. But, but my goodness, you don't want to be using turpentine in your studio. Uh, some people do. Uh, I, oof, I think they're nuts. Anyway, welcome to the 20th century, and I'm choosing my words carefully there. You don't have to use turpentine anymore. You can use it outside, and I have. With a good breeze, it's okay. Just feel bad for the person downwind from you. All right, now, <laughs> that was an interesting detour, wasn't it? Okay, what color's here? Um, I think, I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to do blue and oxide red. Now, what color blue? Uh, phthalo or ultramarine? Um, I might actually do half and half. That'd be unusual. And now the question is, which one do I want to do first? The cool or the warm? I'm thinking out loud here, folks. Do I want to do brown? And then do blue on top of that. Do I want to do blue in the brown? Yeah, I want to do brown. Okay. Whew. 
That took a while, didn't it? Okay, so oxide red, sometimes called transparent oxide red. And if you don't have that on any given day, burnt sienna will work almost as well. I'm going to add a tiny bit of Indian yellow to that mixture. Again, I've loaded up my brushes with lots of liquid. Okay, so the brushes are pretty much saturated with liquid. And a little bit of orange. Okay, let's see. Oops, I can use actually more brown in it. I love doing this in public when I'm, I do a lot of my painting, you know, at events, festivals, weddings, corporate functions, and so on. I love making people gasp. <laughs> it's a little devious of me. Because it looks so... Looks shocking. Okay. okay, that's warm, isn't it? Generally speaking, that's kind of nice. Um, and I'm just going to clean off these brushes real quickly. Hey, sweetie. There's my long lost wife. She yeah, leaves she me lost. for days at a time. <laughs> oh, she brought me an apple yeah, fritter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, there. They, now they can see you. No. Yeah, they can. Oh, no. Oh. All 12 of them. Merry <laughs> 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 Christmas. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, several of the regulars, Susan, Karen, Barbara are all watching at the moment. David was, David was on, I don't know if he still is. I think he was, wasn't he, this broadcast? <laughs> oh no, that was, must have been my last broadcast, yes, anyway. Yes, 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 Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah, thanks. And she knows I'm a absolute sucker for apple, apple fritter, apple so. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> thanks, sweetie. <laughs> um, I won't be long. Um, this broadcast is, I won't, are we, well, are we gonna have, oh, we've got company okay, coming company. for supper, don't we? Okay. Well, good to see. You. I'll I'll finish up yeah. here and then come okay. downstairs and All right. You're not here yet. visit. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. I'm going to mix up. I don't do this very often. I'm not that usually that fussy about which blue I glaze in, but for some reason. And this painting, I, I am more fussy. So I've got ultramarine and um, Dalo both. I don't want I don't want it as cool as ultramarine, and I don't want it as warm as Dalo. So, um, if I were the kind of person <laughs> who used uh, cobalt blue, this would be a perfect time to use cobalt. But I don't use cobalt, so. I find I can achieve all the... All right, so boy, I like this painting better already. I'm So often I'm just still surprised, even after all these years of doing this, I'm still surprised at the, what that does. Now, you know, again, after every stage of the painting process, after every phase, except the last one, it would be fair to say the painting is too blank. It's always too something. Like I, in the last one, I told you it was too soft. Then after the lines, it's going to be too liney or too hard. And then so on and so forth. And so and that's completely expected after each and every phase. So right now, this painting, the one I'm working on right now, is it's lovely, <laughs> but it's a little too dark. Um, the lightest color in it is a, about a number two, maybe a number one on a 10, 10 degree grayscale, right, you with me? So it's a little bit too dark, um, but not a problem because there'll be several stages coming up where it's going to get lighter. Wow. Okay, I guess I, I'm, I guess I am going to lift off a little bit with a rag. I, I was gonna, the wow was saying, wow, I'm not sure I even need to lift off any, but Indeed, I'm going to take off just a tiny bit. Not much, not rubbing very hard, not rubbing very long. Hmm. 
Okay, just just because I've talked about it so much in this painting, this painting that is a an exercise in white, I, and I would, oh, I forgot to take a picture at the last phase. Darn it. Oh, I've been trying to take a picture at every step of the painting process, and I forgot on both these paintings with the last one, so I'm going to have a, a blank there. And now I'm looking for my backup phone camera. Yeah, I didn't expect to be looking this long. Um, because I, I, I definitely want to show students when I'm teaching, and, and that might be a good class someday, how to paint white stuff. I, I get to practice this quite frequently because I paint a lot of weddings. And I don't know if the, you know this or not, but <laughs> most wedding dresses are white or white, as we say in the South. And so I get to ex I get to practice this. Here it is. Got it. Okay, I get to practice this on a very frequent basis. Or I'm so bear with me for a minute here. I need to take a picture. Um, oh, that's dark. Um, this would be a very good demo for students. Um, how do you paint white stuff? This is what my white on white on white painting looks like. Um, you know, uh, at, at what, 70%, 75% completion? The painting looks like this. Does it look like white buildings? Yes, it does. Look like a white car? It does. Look like white clouds? It does. So this is the only part. Does it look like a white road? Hmm. Well, it looks like a white courtyard anyway. The road looks like almost like a dirt road. So. But anyway, look how dark it is. Look how much color there is everywhere. And this is entirely painting of white subject matter. I hope you find that fascinating, as I do. Okay, I'm, I'm looking around here. I picked up some smaller brushes, a, a cheap brush, a, a, cheap, a cheap chip brush, and, and uh, also a cheap fan brush, because I'm looking for, is there, is there anything I want darker, or, or any color whatsoever? Yeah, I do want, I actually want some some reddish down here, I think. So and my favorite transparent red is uh, permanent rose. My good friend Sonia, who's been a participant in our painter's forum for 10 years, maybe, turned me on to, uh, turned me on to permanent rows several years ago. And it's been a permanent part of my palette ever since. All right, so I think I'm done with uh, the, the glaze phase, the glaze stage of painting and now I'm faced with the same question that I had with the uh, woodland painting with uh, Buddy's veil just a little while ago. What do I do next? I have three options. Pencil, paint, or fuzz. Huh? I'm going to do the same thing. How about that? Again, I'm a little bit surprised that I'm doing the same thing with both paintings. That is, I'm going to do fuzz again. So the fuzz layers, I'm picking up a little bit of titanium white, add some Naples yellow to that to warm it up. So I've got a warm white or a very pale yellow, whichever you prefer to call it. And uh, 
here we go same same drill as last time so the fuzz layer is translucent color you can see through it but it's fuzzy misty foggy color uh, soft edges very soft edges for instance I have a, a warm warm white or a very pale yellow whichever you prefer to call it so I've just taken the face of this building which is one of the stronger white areas and I've fuzzed it very soft edges right now what do I mean by soft edge well here's the edge of the building and some of my brush strokes in this case go two two and a half inches away from the object that they're that they are rendering that they're representing same thing here's another white spot right here so what this does if, if there's anything in your painting I'll say use the colloquial you as if you are doing this if there's anything in your painting that you want to give the impression that the sun is just really exploding off that that object which I do indeed here on the dirt the building the building in a minute it'll be the sky a little bit less over here because it's way off to the side uh, the, the back of this car the top of this car see so I'm, I'm if you want something to look like it's bright glowing you give it a soft edge the more brighter <laughs> forgive the grammar the more brighter it is the softer the edges and that is something we all should have learned from Thomas Kincaid he's not the only one by any means but he did a dang good job of saying you guys you want to paint stuff that looks like it's glowing do this and uh, unfortunately too many way too many of my peers were too busy gagging and sputtering and spewing and disgust at Thomas Kincaid partly because he'd made a gazillion dollars and I didn't we didn't um, partly because indeed he made a career out of painting sentimentality it was a lot more fun to talk about him when he was still alive I feel bad about how his journey ended but be that as it may um, I'll just go ahead and say while many of my fellow artists were busy gagging spewing and coughing I was studying his techniques and said hmm, that's a pretty good idea right there I'm sure many of you were as well I'm, I'm not saying I'm unique in that regard but I was unique in the circles I ran around with most of the artists I knew were as I said were busy gagging um, what I'm rebuking here is not artists but is actually the universal human tendency to scoff at anything everything <laughs> and and I try to follow my own advice too you understand I do all right I've just mixed up now a pale blue let's do more of that more th in thalo I'm right at, now I'm doing pure thalo but with dirty brushes so I didn't clean my brushes after the Um, this brush is too small. Oops, sorry about that. Earthquake, earthquake. More of the same. I'm gonna add some, actually, some ultramarine to that mix. fix yeah yeah the whole thing is looking feeling now much more like a hot summer North Carolina summer day which it certainly was the day I was there I didn't want some of this that blue down here now the painting is understand 
the painting is not finished. That's a really important principle, by the way, and I, I find sometimes students have a hard time. They, they want to judge their painting When it's not finished yet, they want to judge it as if it, it, it is finished. They say, well, it doesn't look good. Well, of course there's something about it doesn't look good because it's not done. <laughs> Sorry about that horrible whiny voice, but you guys know who I'm talking about, and I hope it's not you. It doesn't look, it doesn't look good. Well, of course it does. I'm doing it worse just to make it the point. Of course it doesn't look good. It's not supposed to look good. It's supposed to look unfinished, which it certainly does. But the glowy, softish, soft stuff that's happening in this painting right now is gorgeous. There's too much of it. No problem. No problem. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to end this broadcast right there. So you've seen in two different paintings the glaze and then, in both cases, fuzz layer. So I don't always do fuzz after the glaze. I would say now it's about half the time. So the next thing that's going to happen, and uh, I believe it's going to be the same thing here. I think I'm going to draw with pencils next because there's very little pencil still visible from one of, one of my earlier. So unless I miss my guess, which I probably don't, it's going to be draw with pencils, then draw with dark transparent paint, small brushes, and then it'll be the final edit layer. The final edit is the single most important layer and the slowest. The I will not get that to that, to that today. Um, it, is, it is the longest and slowest of all the steps because it's, it is the final edit where you get everything right. Then after that, are you ready? Taking notes. After that, it's broken color. Uh, and then another another universal glaze, and then broken color sometimes, but hopefully broken color, then glaze after it dries. So that's a day or two later, and then um, and then um, palette knife impasto finishing touches. That's a new, very very recent. That's my latest addition to my technique. Uh, impasto thick thick paint, thick strokes. And um, um, some palette knife flatness. All right. So far, I'm liking this painting. I'm liking both of them. They're very different. But I'm going to bid you a fond adieu. <laughs> Thank you, David. Sign your name. It's done. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I think you're talking about this painting. I agree. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, you know, but thank you. That's a, that's a good place to be, um, to say at, at any stage of the painting, say, well, you could sign it and it'd be done. Uh, in, another, in other words, what I'm going to try to do is not ruin this in the subsequent layers, right? Um, it should be easy to do because I could overdo any of the six layers I have yet to go. Overdo any one of them and the painting will diminish. Um, so I appreciate that encouraging word, David. All right, it's been great fun. Thanks, you guys. Love you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.